and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is one of my favorite days of the month because we are being joined by Dr. Doug Lyle, who answers the questions that you guys send in. When we have a doctor on the show in general, and Dr. Doug Lyle in particular, we get a lot of questions. We have so many. I don't know if we'll get through them, so please Always send them in and we'll get started right away. But first, how are you doing, Dr. Lyle? Good, good. Good to see you, AJ. It's, oh, it's, awesome. it's so awesome to see you. We got a, a whole variety of questions. There's not any one particular subject. So we'll just start with this one from Ryan uh, because he's trying to get an appointment with you. He apparently does have one, but it's a little bit further out. I'm a 19 year old male trying to get over an online gambling addiction. It got much worse over the past year in my San Jose State University dorm. And I failed most of my classes because I laid around in my dorm room, stopped attending classes and didn't take my fall 2021 finals. Did a little better in the spring 2022 semester, passing all but one class. However, the gaming continued and I lied to my family about what was really going on, hiding what I was doing until the last possible second. Because my GPA is now below two, I lost my university financial aid and was disqualified as an undergraduate. I have to enroll as an open university student in the fall. And I, I got a follow-up that now maybe not even at that school, maybe like at a, at a GSA or something. I'm currently home for the summer, doing well in my online online summer school courses, but I know I'm still addicted to gaming and want to help get it out of my mind. What can I do to work on it so it doesn't wreck my life and ruin my college career? I have an appointment scheduled with you in early August. Yeah, AJ, I'm confused whether it's gaming or gambling. Well, he's saying gaming. He's saying online. Use the, let me go double check. Gaming. He said online gaming, gaming Got addiction. Okay. Got it. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, th there's there's no in principle difference between this and you know alcohol addiction. So it's a uh, it, it's in, in, in the way that that addiction is going to work is that you're uh, you're going to what's happening there is your what the what the human mind is or the mind of any animal is is it's a resource acquisition device. And so it's designed by nature to try to figure out what is the most important resource to get. Uh, and or we'll say, let's say there's half a dozen resources that are worthwhile. The, uh, what it's going to do is it's gonna run cost benefit analysis on the acquisition of each of those resources. And it's going to uh, make estimates about which resource is going to be the, the most valuable one per unit of effort expended. So, it's a, it's a gambling machine is, is what, what animal brains are. It couldn't be anything else. Um, it, the resources, each one of the, uh, each resource is calibrated naturally uh, in the instinctive machinery of the animal against every other resource. Uh, in other words, so if one resource is 10% better, 3% better, and it's the same amount of energy expended, then go for the one that's 3% better. So uh, in this way, uh, animals, you know, live to reproduce. So this creature is being confronted with supernormal stimuli. So gaming uh, is tickling the instincts of the hunter-gatherer human. Uh, notice that uh, young men are vastly more likely to be addicted to this than young women. That's because uh, young women in the Stone Age did not hunt. Okay, so uh, they are not hunting in warfare creatures. Uh, I think a lot more women are going to be doing like, I don't know, my farm or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or they're, they're addicted to cooking shows or things like that. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some, uh, there's some site out there where all you see is little toddlers smiling and Googling and, and doing goofy things. And we're going to find that, that 90% of the eyeballs that, that follow such a thing are, are women. Okay. So uh, men and women's brains are configured differently for different, uh, significantly different values, depending upon the survival and reproductive problems of the two genders. And so obviously hunting and warfare are male behaviors. And uh, that's, so this kid is getting a super normal stimuli is effectively rather than going out and actually going to war or actually going out there and hunting, he just gets to move a mouse around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 
uh, you, you could you could see you know the, the movie Wall E you know really comes to mind for anybody who hasn't seen it. But like uh, so, I'm I, I understand that Mark Zuckerberg uh, understands what he's doing and he's well aware that his metaverse is on the way. So he just figures he's going to get he's going to get a jump on on the world and he's going to try to you know make make the spectacular innovation and outrageous fortunes uh, as a result of being first uh, and being the first and the best. And so uh, he understands this. He understands that that a simulated world can be a supernormal world rather than the real thing. And therefore, it's going to be very difficult for people to extract themselves and live in the real world as opposed to into a state simulated world. And quite frankly, um, with a mother with Alzheimer's, uh, that I that lives downstairs, um, I could I would put her in a simulated world at this point. So in other words, I'm not saying that all innovation is evil. Uh, so if I hear the Mormon Tabernacle Choir on a on a compact disc, you know, I mean, I'm I'm getting a supernormal stimuli and I'm getting a digital recording of what was a spectacular performance. So I am not down on all supernormal stimuli at all. Okay, the um, but this is an addictive one. This is this is the this is the music so good that you can't do your work because of it. Well, I don't know. You know, there, for some people in some circumstances that that may happen, but for most of us, it doesn't happen. We can we can shut off the stereo of the car, get out of the car, and get into the grocery store and do what we need to do. But if you're failing your classes, uh, and this is a substantial issue, then you need to understand. This is the, it is, it is getting in the ballpark of an alcohol addiction. Okay. So it's not as bad as an alcohol addiction. It's not tearing up your body in the same way, but it's, it's making a mess of your career. Okay. So therefore, I mean, it looks harmless and it doesn't harm you physically. Uh, and it doesn't harm you mentally. It isn't doing mental damage, but it is, uh, it, so it's hard to say like, well, gee, isn't this a reasonable way to pursue my happiness? Well, maybe, uh, maybe you need to completely flunk out and, uh, and you need to, then, then I don't know, then, then you're, one of the problems that we're seeing is that, uh, that a young person like this is an animal in a zoo. So understand that he is not making his own living. He is supported by government grants. He's supported by his mom and his dad. In other words, he's not actually having to contact the real world and do the real world hunting and gathering that is consistent with being an adult member of the species. So if I were his parents and I were worried about this, I would shut off all money, 100% of it. And he would not be going to school in the fall. He doesn't, he, he doesn't deserve to go, okay? In other words, uh, my attitude would be figure it out. We got, and you know, mom might say, oh my God, what about his career? Man, school's always there. School's always there once this person has, you know, has essentially struggled and then understands the value of education after you've worked shoulder to shoulder with the proletariat, uh, you know, for a couple of years uh, at $16 an hour taking orders at Chick-fil-A, okay? Once you've done that, you'll start thinking, wait a minute, I was a student at San Jose State University, for goodness sakes. You know, I had a better future than this. And, and then you're like, hmm, you know, Maybe we maybe we need to be taking care of business. Also, I, I would not put a roof over his head, for goodness sakes. Okay, so this is actually my advice. My advice is not to the young man. The young man is, you know, in, in, a, in an interesting and fascinating and modern version of the pleasure trap. Um, and I would just tell him, hey, stop it. You know, the, the Bob Newhart, you know, what, what, what can you say to, to an alcoholic? Like, you must get yourself organized, cut off all interactions with the people that you drink with, change your habits, and you have to make this the most important thing of your existence, the most important thing of your existence. That's what I would tell this young man, except that he probably can't do it, okay? He's in the throes of a supernormal process, and he's getting supernormal normal feedback for unbelievably uh, the payoff matrix, cost-benefit analysis to a Stone Age brain is overwhelmingly positive. Just keep saying, keep doing it. Why? Because there's no negative consequences. It's like, well, he got tossed out of school, lost his this. No, where's the consequence? Where, where, where did his life experience change? 
His mom nagged a little bit. Big deal. No, you got to put him out on the street. That's what you got to do. Okay. So if you want this young man to beat this problem, this young man needs to actually get an accurate cost benefit analysis of what the problem is right now. So long as he is insulated from the, from the financial consequences of this, then we have an animal in a zoo. Okay. Animal in a zoo does not have to be responsible. Doesn't have to do anything. Just lays around and waits for the, the, the feeder to come around and put food in its bowl. It's a terrible life. Animals don't like it. Okay. But they're not going to turn it down either. So this life doesn't sound that terrible. Sounds like this young man is probably pretty happy, you know, reasonably happy. He's frustrated. He's frustrated because he's an informational addict. He's a, he's a Zuckerberg, he's a Zuckerberg special. Okay. So the, uh, so that's, that's what this is. And the solution to the problem is cut off all the money and make him go fight for it. Go out into the real world with your spear. Okay. And your brains and go out there and see if you can kill a few dollars. That's your job. Okay. And you're going to need to, because you're going to need to pay your rent. So may not need to live in San Jose, pretty expensive. Uh, might have to come out to the central Valley where things are halfway reasonable, where you can get a room for a measly $1,200 a month in somebody's house. San Jose, it might be $2,000. I don't know. I, I don't know that you can earn your living in San Jose at Chick-fil-A. All right. So hopefully people get the idea. Now, I can tell you that this sounds like unbelievably tough medicine, right? So it's like, wow, Dr. Lyle, oh my God, you know, tell him to set my son, you know, out on the street and oh my God, no, no money for him. And, and I, uh, oh, oh no, oh no, oh no, can't. Okay, that's fine. No problem. We can, we can always delay this. You can see how he does in the fall. He can try to work on the problem. Fine. There's no magic here. I'm telling you what the magic is right now. Magic is to get direct, real life experience with the true cost benefit analysis of the problem. So long as you are financially insulated, you do not have to face the problem. Okay, so that's it. So the problem is eminently solvable. I, I would solve this problem in two weeks. <laughs> you would get a two week notice out of my house and you would, I would say, no problem. I will, I will help co-sign a little room agreement for you to be in you know, Millie so-and-so's little, little house over there on the other side of the river. It's kind of, you know, perfectly safe, but not too great. Sometimes people drive by that house, you know, every, every hour, somebody with a bad muffler and a jacked up car drives by there and, you know, rattles the windows in the neighborhood, but it's safe enough. And so that's what you can afford and all guarantee Millie the rent that, you know, I'm going to be after your hide because you're going to be working somewhere at Chick-fil-A or could be Taco Bell. That's the solution, folks. Okay. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Wow. You never cease to impress me. Dr. Lyle, are addictions genetic, how susceptible one is, or does it depend on how super normal the stimuli is? Um, or maybe both. No, it's, it's both. Okay. So undoubtedly, there is some super normal stimuli that anybody could be addicted to. In other words, if we knew that person's brain, uh, we could we could maybe even addict Alan Goldhammer. It would be some super normal game of, you know, closing deals and getting ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Let's do be, it. Let's do it. <laughs> it would be something like that. The uh, you know take take more territory game. But uh, Alan's playing in the real world, so he's having plenty of fun. Oh, thank you. Okay, the next question is from Diana. Most of us have probably heard of elderly people who experience dementia and then have personality changes. For example, a woman who was always very sweet, but then suddenly becomes mean, or the man who didn't swear, but is now using cuss words and doesn't remember his children's names. Is this real? And what do we know about it? Um, I think it is real. So I think it, it depends upon the nature of the, of the particular dementia process. And there's a lot of different ones, um, but the ones that I have personally witnessed, the, the people are pretty similar. In other words, the, the, I believe that most of what is personality is actually not, uh, not in the neocortex. In other words, the, I think it's more down in the, in the more ancient brain. I think it has to do with pre, preset settings and effectively differences in the, the size and and shape and amount of neurons uh, in, in those areas of the brain. 
So I think that the neocortex is mostly about things that you learn in your lifetime. And, um, and so you don't learn your personality. So I'm watching my mother uh, who is, is, is pretty severely demented. And, um, but she still has, uh, it's, it's exactly the same personality. Personality has not changed 1%. She still has a tremendous sense of humor, still has, is very intelligent. Uh, so she'll, she will say things that are, that are just remarkably right on point as if I'm talking to her when she was 40 years old. Um, however, she has vast stretches of, of uh, disorientation where she has no idea. Like she, she will get in, in a bathroom and can't figure out how to get out of it. Okay, so the, um, but the personality, no difference. So, but certainly people will find some things disinhibited uh, uh, so they they will, you know, that, that I think has been common, but I have actually been close to and watched a number of dementia cases. And in every case I've seen, the personalities have remained remarkably similar. So but that isn't, I'm sure that isn't always the case. I have to agree with you, Dr. Lau, you may not know this, but before I went to culinary school, I was a certified memory impairment specialist working ah. with assisted living. And what I noticed is that it, um, if they were mean when they were young, they were just meaner when they were old. If they were sweet when they were young, they were sweeter, regardless of the degree of dementia. It didn't, like you say, it didn't really drastically change their personality. It just made them more of who they were. Amazing. I did not know that, that you did that, AJ, and I'm, I'm glad. So yeah, yeah. you were... Yeah, way more experience than I've had, but it's lining up. Yeah, thank you. you Great minds think alike. I can't, I can't get out of my head. What I'm trying to think of how we can addict Dr. Goldhammer to something. <laughs> we just, we got to think of something. It would be the greatest scientific experiment ever done. I'm That's telling good. you. Okay. We'll, we'll this, know humanity's doomed when, that, when we're able to do that. Uh, this All is right. from Anonymous. However, I get this question a lot, and it seems mostly it comes from wom women, and this is a woman who's uh, writing this. Dr. Lyle, do you have any suggestions to help with freeway, highway anxiety? The level of anxiety varies depending on the amount of traffic, speed of the vehicle, and skill of the driver. It's interfering with social activities, not wanting to go places due to the fear of injury or death or road trips. Sitting in the back seat helps some, but not entirely. Hmm. Um, I, I, I actually don't, uh, know what it is that you can do. You can, uh, anxiety in general, it is particularly if you're taking a little, a little trip, anxiety in general is going to be, um, uh, dissipated to some degree by having, uh, worked out physically before you go. So for example, if you do, um, 15, 20 minutes of calisthenics uh, before you get in the car, then that's going to be helpful. Okay. So if you've got a half an hour car ride to go somewhere in town to meet some people or something, that, that may be a very useful thing. So try that. Let me explain to you. There's reasons why that happens. It's the same uh, reason why if you bang your elbow, human beings will naturally try to rub their elbow. Okay. So what's happening is, is that, that, you, you, when you bang your elbow, that you have a, a bunch of nearby nerves that are sitting right next to the nerve that got banged are still at the same firing rate, but the one that got hit is now much higher. So the contrast between the firing rate of what got hit and the firing rate nearby is so great that the pain is felt more acutely. So human beings naturally know, oh my God, I'm going to rub it. But when you rub it, what you're doing is you're increasing the firing rate of the nearby nerves next to it. Now, it's not as firing as fast as the point that just got hit, but it's firing faster. So now what's happening is, is that the system is getting essentially, it's like uh, an octopus in, in the water. You can't see it. Okay, so you, the contrast is not as high. And so the pain experience goes down significantly. So that's, a, that's a way that we do that. Bang your knee and rub your knee. Okay, so you're not going to help the injury. All you're doing is just that you're putting them a, a, a local anesthetic, essentially, right over the top of that, of that uh, site and, it's, and, and your experience. The same thing is going to go on with anxiety. So when you sit, if you sit in the car and now you're going to start driving and, uh, and now you, all of that anxiety uh, you know, is causing nerves to fire, that's what it is. 
and it's all about you know risk aversion. So all those nerves are firing now way faster than they were before you got in the car. Now, so what do we want to do? We want them all to be firing faster. We want to rub the elbow before we get in the car. If we do that, uh, that when when you start when the adrenaline starts to increase your heart rate, uh, increase your respiration, um, uh, uh, sweating, all the things that are essentially part and parcel of uh, uh, the predator escape strategy, which is what this is. The um, that uh, what what we want to do is is actually uh, um, make it so the heart rate is already up. It's already up. When it goes up a little higher, the contrast isn't as great. Okay, and so your uh, one of the things that causes a sig significant amount of the anxiety is actually the experience of the anxiety itself is a cue to the nervous system that we're in trouble. There, that's, there's a reason why that's true. It's a super uh, important in evolution. And that is that suddenly you can be walking in the woods and you get a feeling that something is wrong. And what will happen is your, some part of your brain has picked up a threat. And so your heart rate will start to go up. And now other areas of the brain will start realizing, hey, wait a minute, our heart rate's up. What's that about? Okay. And it's like, hey, we could be in trouble. And then it'll, it'll start activating and then you'll start sweating. So the adrenaline starts to rise, even though you haven't identified what it is yet, even though part of your brain has identified it. So some part of your brain that's scanning the environment may have noticed, for example, that things just got quieter, but you didn't, you don't, you don't actually have direct conscious awareness that that's what's going on. You've got an unconscious awareness that that's going on. So the thing that happens is that your brain starts responding to this by changing a bunch of the, the physiological processes in order to get ready to run. And you still don't know where you're running or why. And so, but you, it's got your attention. So now it just heightened your anxiety. And now you start looking around what has got me bothered. Okay. Well, you can imagine that if we, um, if we had a way to, uh, if we muted that contrast between quietly walking and then suddenly being creeped out, if we muted it by making the, uh, by the, making the nervous system uh, more active already, then the, then the acute uh, nature of the experience is gonna be muted. So that's what I would have you do. Um, you can also do you know, the muscular contraction exercises that I talk about in panic disorder while you're in the car. So you can clench your legs, okay? You can, you can hold your breath and tighten your stomach like somebody's gonna punch it and, uh, and let that, and, and do that for, and clench your upper body. You can do that for five or 10 seconds and then, then let it release and then do it again and let it release. That will cause the muscular contractions that are associated with escaping a predator, okay? So you can do that and get through just about anything uh, through that strategy. But, uh, the, but the first thing I do is, if you got, if you're nervous about getting in that car, get do at least five minutes of moderate calisthenics before you get in. That may mute down your anxiety quite a bit. Great, All thank right. you, Do thank you, Dr. Lyle. Sure. Okay, this one is from Nat. Why did humans become monogamous when our ancestors were polygamous? Does culture influence us more than evolution? Do so many marriages fail because we're meant to have many partners? You know, this is a, it's such a big question. Uh, you know, this is a Jen Hawk question, if I ever heard one. So Jen's not with us today, but uh, Jen and I do a, a lot of questions like this on the Living Wisdom Library uh, a couple times a month. So if people want to join there, that's a way to also get a copy of our, our to be released book. Not sure when yeah, we're, we're making tremendous progress now. So it's on its way. The, uh, but anyway, but I will take a stab at this um, since my uh, since my, my my fancy doctor isn't with me today. The um, human beings are uh, on a continuum in the animal kingdom between um, what we're going to call uh, He-Man strategy and Hairbond strategy. So He-Man strategy is that that uh, the females are highly receptive to the most sexually attractive males uh, in the species, and 
essentially a few males do almost all of the mating and the, and the vast majority of males go to their graves without ever having mated. That is a, that is a very typical strategy throughout the animal kingdom. It is uh, overwhelmingly dominant in mammals. So the, um, so about 97% of mammals have that strategy. So the, uh, it's a good thing that I'm, you know, wasn't born a llama or something like that. This is, I would have been totally out of luck. All right. So the, um, in a few, in a few species. So in uh, mammalian species, there's about a hundred out of about, out of about 4,000 where, where there is significant paternal investment. So where the male sticks around, um, after conception and can, provides for the female. And the only reason they do that is that they've got bonding chemistry, uh, i.e. what you'd call a true love kind of a situation. So human beings um, are significantly that way, but they're not as much that way as uh, uh, animals that are, that are true full-on pair bonders. So we are in the middle and we can actually tell that we're in the middle through a little, uh, a little graph if you, in, in primates, you can, you can tell how pair bonded a primate species is by actually looking at the testicle size plotted against the body weight of the male. And so uh, the reason why that's true is that the larger the testicles, the more sperm it's making, the more sperm it's making, the more of a he-man strategy it is. In other words, it's just basically, uh, if you get lucky enough to be a fancy male, then your job is to inseminate you know, hundreds or thousands of females in your lifetime. So uh, I think in uh, at one at one point they they were watching some kind of a bird somewhere in the woods, and um, they could see that none of the males of that species were having any action at all, except one guy was, and one guy uh, inseminated maybe a hundred females in a morning. Okay, so just so to let you know, like this is how how this works. So. Um, Anyway, so human beings turn out to be, if you, if you do a, a log linear analysis and put, you know, you, you, you get, you, know, you measure their little gonads and you measure their body weights, and you plot it on the graph, you can turn out that humans are in the middle between pair bond strategy and casual mating strategy. What this means is that, um, that human beings have drifted from what was a casual mating strategy Two million years ago in proto humans and late Australopithecus, uh, to towards a pair bond strategy. They are not a pair bond strategy. They are not a monogamous species today. So the uh, they have uh, so what you have is they're a mixed strategy species. So you will find a bell curve of diversity inside of males' heads, um, where under conditions of great temptation and extraordinary you know, positive feedback and feeling like that they've got themselves a big winner, uh, a male will feel pair bonded and he may feel pair bonded indefinitely. Okay. And by the way, that doesn't mean you have to be a sad sack. I've seen ridiculously handsome, cool guys that were pair bonded their whole lives. <laughs> I have seen this. Okay. Uh, you and I, AJ have met one and I'll tell you his name after the show, uh, that, uh, and it's always kind of a, whenever we see him at a conference, uh, 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 those of us that know are like, that's pretty amazing <laughs> that, that that guy, because he, he could, he could, he could walk into any bar, you know, in any gin joint and walk out with the hot girl. So, but he doesn't, he's a pair bonded guy. So this is how pair bond oriented you are is genetic, but it's going to also be uh, subject to your local conditions to some degree. And so the, um, so you could be heavily pair bond oriented, but it's going to turn out that if you happen to have a great deal of opportunity being heavily pair bond oriented might not be enough to do it. Okay? In other words, you, you just never feel pair bonded because you've got too much opportunity. And if your particular brain says, forget it, you could also be a little sad sack. You can't even get a date, but it doesn't matter. You've got casual mating strategy. It just rages through your head. And the, the fact that you should go all in on, on some, some young lady somewhere just to, to have a partner, but you can't get yourself to do it. Oh, well, 
That's your, your genes are, are checkmating you before you get started. So it's gonna turn out that uh, the average uh, male of our species uh, seeks and feels the desire for a romantic pair bond. Uh, they, they, we, we respond to love stories uh, just as, as females do and the love songs just as females do and feel heartbreak just as females do, except that you're gonna find that the male is more restless inherently. So uh, the, the male is, is, has got more action going inside that head typically than the female does in terms of, out, in terms of uh, diversity and desire for, for multiple partners called plus, plus lifespan, et cetera. So if you ask the average female how many partners she would like in a lifetime today, I don't know who they're asking, some 40 year old that, that responds to surveys. Okay, so somebody in the middle of the, of the range. But if you were to ask them, I think the average female will say somewhere around eight to 10 in this lifetime, which would satisfy their curiosity. Now I know women that would say that's crazy. You know, that's, that's, that's just a, that's just a decent year. What are you talking about? <laughs> okay. And other females would say, you got to be kidding. I only want one. That's it. I never want to see another one. So, but the average will say about eight to 10, the average male will say about 25. Okay. So you can, you can sort of get a snapshot inside of people's heads about the differences between males and females on, in that way. So we are not a monogamous species and we are not a casual mating uh, species. We are in the middle and we, uh, we pursue mixed strategies and those mixed strategies are the source of uh, all kinds of things. A, a lot of excitement and fun for a lot of people and a lot of heartbreak for a lot of people. In other words, so it's not uncommon for uh, males to be pursuing casual mating strategy. The female is hoping he's pursuing pair bond strategy and he's not. And he may be very deceptive uh, about that. And he might even be self-deceptive about it. So he doesn't even figure it out for a couple, three months. So uh, uh, on the other hand, females are not always just simply, you know, wearing the white hats and, and being the exploited. Females a lot of times will act around a, a very fancy male that they're impressed with that, that will act like they are up for just, hey, casual and just be friendly and just have fun. And they may actually believe that. In other words, they may be self-deceptive, but the truth of the matter is they're trying to lure them into a pair bond. Okay. So then they wind up all twisted up and heartbroken and can't figure out why that happened. But the truth is, is that it happened because they were scheming uh, to get some fancy genes and they were acting like they were up for a, for a casual mating strategy process and they weren't. Okay. So these, these can be consciously known strategies. They can also be unconscious and self-deceptive. Uh, but this is um, part of the swirling cauldron uh, of excitement and frustration that goes on. But if you think that's tough, you know, just about the time you think, wow, what a, what a, what a total swirling cauldron of heartache and mess and, and uh, et cetera. But the truth is, is that remember our friends out there in the He-Man strategy where, where, uh, where one male is the king and everybody else gets to go scratch. So the, uh, so from the females might say, well, what's wrong with that? You know what I mean? It's, it's easier for us. It's just different. So throughout nature, these are highly conflicted trades because they're the most expensive, most important trade that takes place uh, in the life of an animal, fundamentally. I mean, you might say, hey, forget it, it's not that important to me. But in the life of an animal, this is the highest stakes that there are. So we would expect it to be highly conflicted, and it is. But aren't there species that do make for life, a few of them, other than humans? No, I don't think that's ever been found. In other words, what they have is that they have, uh, it's always on a continuum. So they may be mating uh, for life for, for you know, uh, under ideal conditions. And so a lot of members of that species may wind up mating for life, but you are going to see conditions under which uh, uh, individuals of that species will not be because of you know, hey, listen, somebody made me a better offer. You got your paw injured and now you can't, you know, you can't manage to get back and help the pups, whatever. In other words, um, when this has been looked at very carefully and, and the easiest set of species to examine this has been birds. Uh, uh, so different bird species, some of them are very pair bond oriented. Some of them are totally casual mating strategy. Uh, we do see that ones that look very pair bond oriented, if we watch them exceedingly carefully, there is always tension in the system, as you'd expect. 
Wow. We don't get to just seal it up and just forget it. You know, there's always uh, there's always competitive tension percolating underneath you as long as you live. Right. People are discussing in the chat who the person can be. And so far, the no number one vote is Dr. Columbus Batiste. Uh, no, that's not who it is. That's uh, well, okay. I guess they were just voting for the best. Look just, yeah, yeah, of course. I, I, it's all, all fair. All good. Yeah. OK. <laughs> uh, Sam wants to know, why would nature create people with emotional instability? What kind of evolutionary advantage could there be? Um. The instability, if you, if you have to look at the whole bell curve of, of instability. And um, uh, so uh, the, I think if you want a long discussion about this, Jen Hawk did a very long uh, lecture, uh, le lecture series on this and for the Living Wisdom Library where she goes through uh, personality in, in fine detail. But in this particular uh, instance, the instability, uh, you have to imagine the utility of instability by looking at the other side of the bell curve at high stability. So if you're extremely stable, then you cannot get excited over a really good opportunity. You just, you can't, you're, you're not, you know, it's like you can imagine, I don't know, living in, you know, being a, being a rancher in Stockton in 1848 and you hear about a gold strike at, at Sutter's Fork, and it's not very far away. And you're like, yeah, whatever. It's like, whatever. You're one of the first people here. All you have to do is get up, you know, get, get on your horse and, you know, uh, take, take, you know, two, a couple days ride and get up there, take some food and find out what on earth is going on at Sutter's Fork, for goodness sakes. No, can't do it. It's just not worth the trouble. Well, one guy from South America heard about the gold strike, you know, in 49, and he got his way all the way to the bit, you know, to, to, Cal, to California gold country. And that guy went up into the back rivers that had not yet been explored and made one of the huge fortunes, you know, in, in California. That guy, he was way late and he got there. So you can think about that. So think about uh, stability being a handicap that doesn't get you moving. Think of a guy that's like, you know, he's smelling some smoke in his house. It's like, well, it's probably, it's probably nothing. You know what I mean? It's probably, uh, it's probably just something. But the next door neighbor's probably got a barbecue. Hey, your house is burning down. You're damn near dead. And you're not moving fast enough. So you can see, oh, we admire stability. But the truth of the matter is, there's nothing to admire about it. Okay, it's uh, the truth is is that the optimal place for human beings is in the middle of the bell curve. If you're extremely stable, there will be costs associated with that. The uh, the uh, there there will be a lack of responsiveness to emergency. Now you may have your IQ and your conscientiousness bail you out, but you might not. Okay, so. Um, Anyway, so on the other side, unstable is going to be highly reactive and therefore uh, essentially very excited when there's an opportunity and therefore willing to invest energies. So, and also very uh, just upset, you know what I mean, when things go wrong and therefore more catastrophic. And you might say, well, what's the good in that? And the answer is, well, it, it has its moments where it's gonna help you win. Okay. It's also going to be very expensive in a lot of ways, but it's no worse than being highly stable. That's why these, these um, personality characteristics fall on bell curves. So, and what that means is, is that most people are in the middle of the graph. If we were to total them up and we had 100 people and they were a random draw of the population, we would find that 60% 60, uh, 60 of the people six, are they're stacked up here at medium scores. Be like you know on, on a test in, in in your math class you know out of, out of 10 questions most people got seven right and then some people got six right some people got eight right and then a few more people got nine right and a few people got five right and then you know a couple people got 10 right and a couple people were were, were at four the real easy questions and it's a bell okay so uh, and personality characteristics and intelligence are distributed in bell curves. And that tells you the telltale sign of the genetic code 
uh, that over time it found that that this medium amount of what we call emotional stability, we call it normal. Why? That's why we call it the normal curve, okay? Normal's in the middle. And as we go to the sides, what we find out is that the distortions of the cost-benefit calculus of, of your responsiveness as a nervous system is penalizing you on, as you go further on either side of the bell curve because you're more and more distorted relative to how the species would optimally act under conditions of either opportunity or threat. Okay, so that, that's what's happening. So highly unstable is just a person that's highly reactive to both opportunities and threats. Um, you know, if I was a little more unstable, I would have bought Bitcoin 10 years ago when I, uh, when I first heard about it. <laughs> I'd be like, oh my God, oh my God, so, that sounds ingenious. Oh my God, I got to get in on that. So I didn't. <laughs> How did Alan miss that? Okay. Answer, super stable. I'm sure he heard about it. Uh, and we, we found it somewhat interesting, but it wasn't interesting enough. Okay. So that's how that works. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of unstable stable people out there that made a lot of money on Bitcoin. And now they, uh, they lost a lot of money on Bitcoin in the last three months. But oh, well, such so is the life of, of the, the exciting personality. And that's what unstable is. They're exciting. They're <laughs> very excited about new things and they are very devastated when things go sideways. Sounds like me, Dr. Uh, Lyle. Uh, Sounds uh, like you're describing I, me. I, I wasn't going to out you, AJ. <laughs> oh my God. No, it's okay. I get it. Well, you know, like, but think about it. Like I just went to the Van Gogh uh, immersion experience and, you know, I didn't realize that he committed suicide and he had, you know, was in an institution, but look at the art he created. Yes. Right. In fact, you're going to find that many of your greatest artists are very unstable. Yeah. So, okay. uh, well, I'm going to start a club. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tchaikovsky. You know what okay. I mean? Very unstable. All right. Um, this is from Sue Ann. She says, Dear Dr. Lyle, I watched your video on why we should not weigh and measure our food, and it made sense to me. What I'm wondering, though, is that why that approach continues to remain so popular and in the food addiction world, absolutely mandatory. They seem to believe that somehow we are broken and can't trust ourselves to know when to stop eating unless we restrict quantity. But my biggest question is why do they insist that even calorie dilute non-starchy vegetables be weighed and measured and limited because they claim that people suffer from a volume addiction and they believe they get some kind of benefit from overeating even if it's healthy food. Is any of this based on actual science? No. Wait, you, you do it again because it- Bro. No, this is just- uh... Uh, it's just ignorance. You know, pe people are ignorant about a lot of things. And so uh, whoever is, is touting that concept is just somebody that doesn't know the facts of reality. Oh, well, you know, a lot of people don't know. <laughs> you know, it, it, if I sat down, you might say, how, how could they be so ignorant? If I sat down with, with 10 well-educated, well-educated psychologists, okay? so the, the 10 best educated psychologists in Sacramento Valley, if I were to talk to them, I would find them to be appallingly ignorant about my field. And so the, uh, that's, a, that's my field. Uh, if, if I were to talk to a bunch of eating disorders counselors, they would be completely ignorant about how to, how to direct people with eating disorders. So it's no surprise that, you know, remember the weighing and measuring is a, is a very good way to play on the hyper-conscientious nutcase you know personality so it, it gives them a, a, a sense of it, it's very similar to the hand washing of an ocd person so the hand washing for an ocd person like you know my friend my, i have a good friend that's ocd and he's a hand washer he feels so relaxed for a short period of time you know that it's like you know if he sees me touch something when we're out and about doing stuff he, he'll have a little bottle of that alcohol, you know, sanitizer. I said, you sure you don't want some? <laughs> he doesn't even want me getting in his car and touching the handles unless I've had a little bit of that stuff on my hand. And I tell him I'm not doing it, you know, and he doesn't like that. I don't like that stuff on my hands. So the, um, 
so in the same way that that uh, that the weighing and measuring will soothe the OCD soul, and it's like I, I'm in line, everything's fine, everything's I'm, I'm doing everything right, I'm right within the, the boundary lines, and so they can feel some safety about that, and so that uh, because that's true, that that message isn't going away. There there's a there's so many people in, in uh, there's a significant market niche of individuals who feel way more comfortable. You know, it's, it's kind of like a, 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 a dog that likes to be in his doghouse and doesn't want to leave it. It's like, I'm comfortable here. So that idea is not going away. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's rooted in ignorance. Uh, it, it seems superficially true, even though, you know, in other words, a lot of things seem superficially true the, um, uh, and, and turn out to be not be true. So it, it seems superficially true. So therefore, it seems to make some sense. Uh, and it, it soothes the comfort of the high anxiety OCD uh, type person who feels like, OK, as long as I'm weighing and measuring, I'm within the rules. I, I, I will succeed that makes logical sense. We look at this thing and say, this is completely ridiculous and ludicrous. You can't measure your calories. There is no human being on earth that can measure, measure the calories. The calories are not measurable. Why do you say this? I remember I got confronted uh, about 10 years ago by Colin Campbell on this. <laughs> and, and Colin says, uh, we're, we're talking about calories. He goes, what's a calorie? And I said, well, it's a, the amount of energy it takes. He goes, no, 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 no. Tell me what a calorie is to a person when they're digesting it. I said, and he goes, you don't know, do you? I said, well, actually, I don't. He goes, good, because it's not known. <laughs> it's not known. It's no idea. You, you, can, you can measure the calories in a piece of steak or in a carrot. You can put them in a burner, and you can say that we've got an index for it, and we can burn it to a crisp, and we can say, oh, it released X amount of energy, and therefore that carrot had 200 calories in it. That has bears no relationship to the truth about what it does in a human body. None. It's BS. Okay. I'm not going to say it's not related at all. It's correlated with the truth, but that's all it is. And Colin says, nobody has any idea. So if you think that you can measure the corn out and then measure the, the, the sprouts and then measure the, the blueberries and then measure the chunk of salmon, and you know that that's 1800 calories for the day, that is complete bullshit. You can have another meal of 1,800 calories out of the same calorie book. And if you actually look at human beings, uh, it's going to turn out that if you fed uh, that, that same human being those two different meals, they'll gain weight on one of them and lose weight on the other. And they both say 1,800 calories. Okay. So, yeah, weighing and measuring is bullshit. So thank you. I'm glad to have that on record because the people that do it, I mean, it's like their religion and they get so upset when you say that. Yeah, well, now, now you go confront the person who's selling that and you sh have them show you the science that they know that those calories are converted calorie per calorie in terms of energy utilization inside of a human being. And you will find that the answer to that is no, they don't know because that is not known. Done. Checkmate. It's over for that concept. Okay, so there you have it. On we go. Right. But e even some doctors I re respect think that like people can overeat carrots because I guess they feel something is released when they overeat. And, and I, it just, it makes no sense to me that they think this volume addiction exists. Um, volume addiction is a little bit of a different question than, than this. So we, we sort of morphed our way into, cause there's, there's two different considerations there. One is, is that weighing me is measuring a good idea. And does it make sense? Can you actually know how many calories you're eating? And the answer is no, you can't. Okay. So this, the second move is, is the, are there people that are, um, uh, that, that could be, for example, uh, overeating on a natural food uh, because, uh, because they are, because there's been some, there's some dysfunction in the, in, the, um, uh, in the satiety mechanism. Now, this gets interesting. And I will argue that it's not going to come from eating too much. It's, I, I would argue that the following is possible. And now I'm speaking outside of my knowledge. 
I'm just speaking as somebody who's watched the problems for 30 years. And I believe that this exists and I have fiddled with it uh, with people and I have been clinically successful. So, but that is a long ways from being able to prove it. So let me tell you what I think is true. I think it is possible that the natural history of the species and the satiety mechanisms are designed by nature to be analyzing multiple components of food, not one. So, the, uh, so that's why we have nutrient reception and stretch reception. And I believe that it is possible that you could have a food stuff um, that would be of say lowish or intermediate calorie density that is so low in, in other words, your diet could be so low in fat content or protein content, for example. Um, it could be so low that, 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 um, that those receptor sites are not being activated. And so the person may be full and they may be getting stretch reception telling them that they've eaten plenty and eaten too much, but they have some nutrient essentially desires in the system that are not getting activated. And therefore, essentially they're chasing satiety by leaning on nutrient, or excuse me, by leaning on stretch reception instead of a balanced diet that is going to actually uh, also be hitting nutrient reception at the same time. So this is the notion of, I don't know that how many carrots, I, if, if I was eating carrots for my mainstay, you might say, well, why couldn't you just eat 10 pounds of carrots a day and have 2000 calories a day? And the answer is I could, but you might, I don't think I would be overeating on the carrots, but I would certainly be cramming them. You know what I mean? It could be uncomfortable and bizarre. Um, and uh, the, anyway, what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that I think there are people that are eating bizarre looking volumes of food and they're doing that uh, because the volume, uh, the, the, the caloric density of their food volume is so low that their satiety mechanisms have no choice. You know, they're, they're just a simple, they simply have to get enough calories. And so that's what they're going to do. The, um, and I think that they could eat a diet that had higher density calories in it and not be overeating and not be eating such a, a volume of food. They could do that. In other words, so I believe that there's going to be functionally equivalent diets that one of them could be 600 calories a pound. One of them could be 550 calories a pound. One of them could five, be 500 calories a pound. One of them could be 400 calories a pound and one of them could be 300 calories a pound. And if you're eating a 300 calorie pound diet, you're going to be cramming a tremendous amount of, of food in that stomach. Okay. If you're eating 600 calorie pound diet, you're not going to be. And so the, I can see that, that people could look at people that are cramming huge amounts of food and basically saying, oh, there's something broken in you. No, there's not something broken in you, but you're eating a funny looking diet. Uh, you can, you can do that. Now, the question would be, are you systematically overeating because there's something wrong? Mm, I doubt that. You'd have to prove that to me. So you, you'd have to show me people that were eating 450 calorie a pound diets and that they were systematically overeating on those diets and that they were remaining overweight. Uh, I, I would be open to the scientific evidence uh, on, that, on that question. It would be an interesting thing to find out. Um, I, I'm skeptical that such a thing is, is possible, but who knows? And there may be outliers. So this is also where we get into, um, it's possible that there could be rare individuals and they would have to be rare. There would be outliers where their mechanisms uh, might be might be a funny looking mechanism, and they might be they might actually work better on a more balanced diet than one that was more dilute. Possible. The uh, so anyway, but the point is is that is is a general uh, it's a general overview of what we know that your um, your satiety mechanisms, if you're eating whole natural foods, that would be whole natural representative of a human diet. So whole natural foods would be peanuts and salmon, okay? Those are whole natural foods. 
peanuts, salmon, and avocado, but that th those would be unnaturally rich relative to the typical exposure of human beings to their natural habitat. So when I talk about a natural diet, I talk about a diet that looks like the hunter-gatherer diet, you know, reasonably, obviously we here are gonna pull the animal food out, but we had better replace it with something that's a facsimile. Uh, and, and that's going to be, you know, the closest thing are going to be the starches uh, to that. And then also a variable addition of nuts and seeds and avocado, uh, quite frankly, you know, you know, that those are, those types of things would be spiked uh, in, in a, in an average person's vegan, super healthy diet in order to bring our overall calorie density, uh, you know, in the five to 600 calorie pound range. If we, another thing that people will use that is, is not natural food, but is close would be dried, dried, dried whole carbohydrate, i.e. Ezekiel bread. Okay. But I look at those things uh, with an eyebrow up because those things are 1600 calories a pound. So those are twice as calorie dense as the steak that they are inherently replacing. So um, anyway, every, this is where we get into individual differences, weight loss, weight management. Everybody's, every single person's biology is, is unique. And so we know what works very well is a dilute five to 600 calorie pound whole natural foods diet, uh, eating, eating to satiation and not worrying about weighing and measuring for any reason under the sun. We do that until it's proven wrong. Okay. And so, uh, that that's, we do that for you, whoever you are, that is that diet is innocent until proven guilty. If it's proven guilty, then you call me up and we troubleshoot. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. I just want to read a comment from Hattie. Dr. Lyle is the best human ever, just so you know. And uh, people are saying uh, weighing and measuring is a self-selected prison, says Rebecca, and that uh, Susanna is saying it failed her for years. Yet people keep going back to it. It's so interesting. Well, they're looking for, they're trying to like, they're trying to get some control. And sometimes uh, I can remember, AJ, I had a client, um, but I didn't like to see her. Uh, she was kind of a, a, a little bit of an ornery person. And um, uh, so she, she would come in and she, she was pretty disabled and she actually rode a little device into the office. And she was probably 60 and I was a whippersnapper at 40. So she already had an eyebrow up and that she, she didn't have a lot of respect for me. But she wanted to come in and lose weight. And she did not come because she had heard of True North or Doug Lyle or Alan Goldhammer or the American Natural Hygiene Society. This was just a woman in off the street with her insurance. And so she came in and she wanted to lose weight. And it's like, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, let me, let me show you my stuff. And, and she listened. She was halfway respectable, irritated, and then went, went came back. And then she was excited about some very narrow diet. And I can't remember what it was, you know, cabbage, applesauce and tuna fish. I mean, whatever it was. And I said to her, you don't need to do that. You know, we were talking, we've talked to you about all the things that you can eat. So we want to make this as easy as possible. Uh, and so look at all the things that I would tell you that are perfectly fine. Just do, go do all those things. That woman was mad at me because she wanted it to be narrow. She, she wanted sort of the magic and the, and the reduced options. She wanted to eat tuna fish, cabbage, and applesauce. I mean, I, that isn't what it was, but it was like that. It was like three things. Like, this is the magic diet. I'm excited about it. This is what I'm going to eat. What do you think? And my reaction was, I don't think it's that good a diet. You don't need to do it. Here's a better way to do it. Do it that way. All bent out of shape. <laughs> I, it was amazing. And so the so I would tell you there are people that want the rules, and they want those rules, and they don't want it deviated, and their anxiety goes up. You know, if we if we say actually there's a better way to do it, where you're a more free ranging chicken for God's sakes, just go do do it this way within these boundary lines. Don't cross over the river. But in this space, go anywhere you want. 
that to me, you know, seems like un unbelievably rational and freeing. And that's what we tell people. And, uh, and yet there's going to be people who by personality are rebelling. And what can we say? Go listen to Chen Hawk and listen to all the diversity of personality because the diversity of personalities go all the way from Albert Einstein to Elvis Presley. Okay, so the, you, the people are so inherently different. And even when people are working on the same problems, they are different. You know, you talk, talk to 10 musicians and those, those 10 people are, are all in the same, you know, they're all working the same kinds of problems, but they are so different in terms of their personalities. And that's gonna be true of people who are trying to lose weight. Thank you, Dr. Lyle. I love when you talk about this subject. Okay, this is from Kim. What is Dr. Lyle's opinion on the merits of keeping a daily gratitude journal? Does it help improve a person's positivity and happiness? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I think people will try those kinds of things from time to time. I think uh, sometimes it may work for, for some people. I think that... Um, um, I don't do such a thing, but it doesn't stop me from uh, having many moments of profound gratitude, you know, in, 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 usually within a week. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen. Uh, it, it's not far away because it's a component of my personality. So I think that I think uh, going through those processes, I'll explain very briefly that that um, you don't get to consciously choose what it is that's going on inside your head. Uh, your, your brain is a, a mechanism that is running unconscious calculations. And you might say, yes, but can't I override them? No, you can't actually. There is no overriding of these unconscious calculations. What there are is that there, you have conscious awareness of the unconscious calculations to some degree. You have a, a small awareness. You have awareness of, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to go buy a truck and it's either going to be a Ford or a Chevy. So you've got awareness of, of the fact that you are, that you are in the process that your unconscious mind is driven and motivated to go buy a truck. And it, you, you have conscious awareness of that, but you aren't consciously choosing that the unconscious mechanism is doing that. So your consciousness is essentially a flashlight on top of an unconscious process. And it's a flashlight on top of a part of it. So when someone says, well, what if I, I do a gratitude journal? Well, you'll do a gratitude journal if your unconscious calculator tells you that it's a good idea. <laughs> okay. And so then if you do it, okay, uh, uh, what will happen is so there will be some cost benefit that will happen. And the unconscious calculator will calculate whether or not it's worth continuing doing it. Okay. And, uh, and so th this is sort of, it's a auto catalytic process or it isn't. And so, um, so very often, so what we'll do is we will try things because the unconscious calculator will hear that somebody does something and it does good for them. And Tony Robbins says it's good. And therefore, so you're like, well, maybe that will be a secret trick to making my life better. Okay. And, uh, and so then we'll try it and we'll run an experiment. And we may find that it works for you, or we may find that it doesn't. Okay, so, uh, and people are, are novelty seeking creatures that they like to look over the next hill and see if there's something that they didn't know before. And what they don't realize a lot of times is that the experiments that they're running are actually experiments of self discovery. So we're not discovering what works qua human, we're discovering what works for me. Okay, and so you may do that. So I, uh, I've tried a number of things like, okay, I'm going to get up every morning and I'm going to, you know, work out. Well, I never do that. <laughs> so that didn't work. You know, sort of tries that this now and then I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I have, uh, I've made many attempts to sort of change my habitual patterns and all those were, were experiments. And uh, probably, probably the most famous chronicler of that process was Benjamin Franklin, who his whole lifetime uh, was taking notes on all kinds of things where he wanted to self-improve. And he's got an amazing number of beautiful things that he has said, uh, little little sayings that, that we know to this day that people try to use to remind themselves to try to do some self-improvement things. 
I have found things that I have done that have led to self-improvement because when I did them, the cost benefit was worth it. Okay. So what do I say about that gratitude journal? Try it and see if it does something for you. Um, for me, uh, I, I have, uh, that, that's not what I do. I have a journal that I will journal about my life and about my, my struggles and my decisions and what I'm thinking. And that, that process of doing that um, is, is something that is very valuable to me. Wonderful, thanks. Um, so you got I've read couple more questions. Okay, so. sure. I've read some, you tell me anytime you wanna stop. I've read some studies that were done on creative output where classes of students were divided into two groups. One group was told they would be graded on quantity of submissions like sculptures and paintings, and the other group graded on quality and given the directive to produce one item and make it as perfect as a masterpiece as possible. It was claimed that the quantity group ended up producing the better work, and often the quality students didn't even produce one piece, or if they did, it never matched up against the group told to make as many things as they can. Does Dr. Lau think this is true and is a good model for a creative person to follow? Um, actually that's, that's a wonderful study. And I didn't know about that study, uh, but it, what all this is, uh, this is, this is a straight ego trap study. So that, that, um, and so notice what the people that are doing the study didn't appreciate about what the process was. This shows you that, uh, just to slap my competitors in the world of experimental psychology, they actually don't understand this process very well. So uh, this is also true of this smacks of uh, Carol Dweck's work at Stanford on mindset. So uh, in other words, Carol Dweck ran experiments that work, but it turns out that she doesn't understand why. And the same way the people that did this aren't actually understanding why. It isn't the search for quality stopped you. It's the fact that you thought that I was going to be graded and therefore that my gene quality was going to be measured by my performance on this. And therefore, if you're going to measure my gene quality on my performance, then the right thing to do is to do nothing. Okay. So uh, I run the cost benefit analysis and I basically say, I'm not going to produce anything. Then. Okay. And this way, that way you can't tell what I'm capable of doing because I didn't do anything. All right. So Whereas you say, oh, well, we're going to judge you on how much you produce and we don't give a damn about what it looks like. Well, in that case, I'll just throw out crap. Alan Goldhammer just turned into a famous artist at that point. Okay. Uh, we famously uh, got a different grade in our art class in junior high because he, he was terrible, by the way. I was much better. But I got a B and he got an A because uh, he, uh, <laughs> he, 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 uh, uh, had somebody uh, the, the, at the car wash, we had our art up there and the owner of the car wash bought his for a dollar or 50 cents to get it off the wall because it was so bad. He didn't want it up there. That's a true story. Okay. And so, uh, and Alan told the teacher, you can't give me a B. I'm a professional artist. I made money off my art. <laughs> anyway, the point of all this is that this is straight ego trap. So if I changed the, uh, the wording and I changed the process by which that, that why the judgment was being made, we wouldn't find the effect. We had to have a social rating process that the person was under that pressure, uh, et cetera. Okay, that's how that works. Now, it is uh, obviously an artist might have in their head this very trap. But the fact that they have it in their trap, there's a good chance that the reason it's there is genetic. Okay, so certain people are far more genetically susceptible to the ego trap than others. It depends upon how you analyze the parameters of how other people are going to judge you, et cetera. Now, the question is, can you help people out of the ego trap that are in it? The answer is yes. Okay, so uh, a skilled therapist who understands uh, the trap, or if I, can, if I can just tell you what the trap is, that you know, very often I help people out of the ego trap by explaining the mechanics of the ego trap. Okay, and so explain that that your mind is running an unconscious cost benefit analysis where you are afraid to be exposed for what your real talents are. And the thing is, is that you're afraid 
that, um, and you also are believing that your, the effort that you put in is going to be then the end all be all litmus test for what your talents are. And that's where the inferential mistake is. And so we have to understand that all artists or all creative process or all ability in anything winds up going through a learning curve process that is unpredictable. And there are fundamentals that have to be mastered, et cetera. And so as a result of that, I, what I will tell people is I, I don't tell them, oh, you're gonna be judged on your quantity. I tell them, I expect you to struggle. I expect you to have failures. This is a intrinsic part of the process. You know, Alexander Graham Bell didn't figure it all out in one swoop. It was a bunch of experimentation. Thomas Edison had over a thousand different things that he tested before he got a light bulb to work, okay? And so we are going to, anything that is difficult is going to be a process of trial and error. And you, it isn't trial and succeed and trial and succeed. It's trial and error and trial and error and trial and error and trial and succeed. And now we learn something, okay? So that is, so I expect that to be true. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put some effort in and at the end of 90 minutes of effort, we are unlikely to be in exactly the same place that we started. So are you willing to risk 90 minutes of effort and see whether or not anything changes? That's what we're gonna do. And my, I believe that something will change. I don't think that we're gonna have the Mona Lisa at the end of this 90 minutes, but we are going to have something that we learn. So when I frame it that way, I'm becoming the outside agent that is saying, I am not judging your gene quality on what you produce in the next 90 minutes. The other people are saying that. You're going to be judged by the quality of the, well, you just told me that you're analyzing my gene quality by what it is that I produce. In that case, I'm not producing Jack, okay? So that is what this experiment is. And this solution to the problem is, the, is uh, uh, out of the ego trap is what we're gonna call process over outcome. So that's vaguely what they did with that study. They said process. Process is to throw a bunch of spaghetti at the wall, okay? And, uh, and outcome was clearly, oh, we're gonna judge the outcome. Oh, that's, that's as plain as day that it's, it's outcome over process for those people. So we have to change it up and say, listen, it's process over outcome. We expect the outcome to be lousy in the interim term. It, it couldn't be anywhere, couldn't be anything else. And I will tell people stories, tell the story of uh, the great uh, songwriter, rocker Bob Seeger, talking to young Glenn Fry and Don Henley. They're young guys that were the, the, the core of the Eagles. And they came to him and he respected them. And he knew they were fine musicians. And uh, uh, they said, hey, how do you write a good song? You know, we, we need our own stuff. And, uh, and he said, first you write a bad song and then you write a lot of bad songs. And then you'll write a good song, <laughs> i.e., let's get him out of the ego trap, and that's what happened. They they looked up to him for you know their, their whole lives, the, uh, because of that. All right, one yeah, more think, super quick one. Okay, super I quick. just wanted to say I had a feeling you were going to say it's the ego trap, and I had a business mentor early on that told me done is more profitable than perfect. So my philosophy in life is just if you throw enough shit against the wall, something's going to stick. <laughs> That's great, AJ. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank All you. Right. Okay, so last question, and this could be as long or as short as you want, but I'm picking it because it's the shortest one from Jennifer. Dr. Lyle, why is it so hard to let things go? And is this harder for women? No, it's not harder for women. This is a personality characteristic that's um, uh, letting things go. Uh, we're talking about some transgression or irritation with somebody else and Etc. This is um, this is part and parcel. You can see little personality characteristics that would be feeding into this. Conscientiousness would feed into it. Uh, disagreeable would feed into it. Um, some emotional instability would feed into it. Those three personality characteristics would swirl around and create a, a cauldron where that person is less likely to let things go than somebody else. Okay, super stable person. It's like eh, so they've got gold and Sutter's meal. Eh, whatever. Oh, so somebody did something disappointed me. Eh, okay. 
<laughs> you can just see that, okay? You can see the other side of that. Somebody's much more excitable, it's going to mean more. It's gonna be more juice behind uh, something like this. And so if you're more disagreeable, uh, you're gonna feel uh, like you need to penalize and correct people because you have been wronged and therefore, you know, we need to get it right, okay? Uh, and conscientious is, is, a, is a, uh, a, a sort of a, 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 a tense system that says we, we have to get, everything needs to be done by the rules and properly. You did me wrong. You know, you, there could be very decent people that's got a little disagreeable streak and, and highly unconscious, and they are not going to leave that store until they, they'll spend two hours to get $10 back. Okay, it's like, I don't need, I will not leave, this has to be right, okay? Whereas somebody else would just say, oh, forget it, it's, you know, oh, forget it. You're, it's not even worth asking. The, 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 that, that's, that's the other side of that. So if you, have, if you have very stable, agreeable, not very conscientious, it's like, oh, why even bother, forget the whole thing. Okay, so these are the individual differences. And so the, uh, I, I don't think that women are, are, are more susceptible to this characteristic than men at all. It's just that uh, they, they may have more grievances in relationships behind infidelities, casual mating struggles, what, males, so that the, the cultural zeitgeist is about the, the women complaining about men, about men doing bad things. Like there's some show that they did on TV 10 years ago for a while called men behaving badly and i never watched it but i i rolled my eyes it's like okay well you know we can sniff what this is about notice that we don't have a a show that says women behaving badly you know we don't have that okay so the uh so the fact that uh women uh find it open season to complain about men because there are there are a lot of situations where women get feel like they get double crossed behind casual mating strategy uh uh, what do you call it? Uh, proclivities and, and deceptions and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we understand that. Yeah. So Shakespeare wrote, you know, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. The, uh, so we, we, we get that. But if we looked at it, as Jen would say, writ large, if we were to look at all of human beings and all the things and people letting go of things that they're mad about and revenge and trans, you know, all that kind of stuff. No, I don't think there's any difference. So men are more about, hey, you insulted me. Hey. Would you say about my car? <laughs> you know what I mean. That, that's a uh, they're they're less likely to let go on other kinds of things, uh, and but but we but that's not sort of understood to be part of that problem in the culture. All right, all this right. Was a, this was a lot of fun, Doctor Lyle. We got to all but three questions. I'm going to save it. Maybe next time we won't announce you coming on, and then we won't have as many questions. That's fine, AJ. That's Absolutely. Fun. We just have to find a way to addict Alan Goldhammer. It will be the great, we could win a Nobel prize. <laughs> there's, there's that age of excitement. You're saying it. There do it you want to, do you want to know something? I don't know if I ever told you this, Dr. Lau, when, when we lived in the desert, he, him and Jennifer came to visit us and we have a Pac-Man machine because Charles loves Pac-Man, but Charles doesn't really have an addictive personality. He can take it or leave it, but you know, we, we got a great price. So he, he played it occasionally. And so Alan apparently maybe likes it or did like it. And Charles said, you know, do you want to play? And he played it and he goes, you want to play again? And he goes, no, no, I better not. You know, like, it's like, he just, it was like fun. And I guess he was worried or something. Uh, you know what? Pac-Man for Alan would be actually a problem because all that incremental positive feedback, you know what I mean? I, I could, I could see that and I could see his brain, that extraordinary conscientious and intelligence looking at that and saying, uh-oh, <laughs> that could keep me away from my business. You know what I mean? I could actually see that. I'm so. going to buy him one and have it sent to his house. <laughs> I'm going to torture him. All oh, right. Well, it's always so much fun, Dr. Lyle. Thank you so much. All right. Great seeing you. But thanks, everybody. Great questions. Thank you. And thanks, all of you, for the great questions. Always send them in when we have doctors as guests. We've got Dr. McDougall coming up twice next week. You know how it is with doctors. You need to send them in in advance. And please come back tomorrow when I have two firecrackers. Jane and Ann Esselstyn will be talking about their new book.